Constitutional Chats. My name is Janine Turner. I'm the founder of Constituting America. Thrilled that you're with us today. We have a great show. I'm going to introduce this fabulous co-host panel, and then we're going to get to our oh so brilliant. We, we were so, we were so intrigued talking with him. We almost were late starting the show because we just wanted to keep asking him questions. We have Dr. Matt Wasniewski with us today. We're so excited about this. The historian to the House of Representatives. All righty, so I'm gonna do some intros here. And here we go. Today, we are continuing our series, Congress and the Constitution. For the next six weeks, we will explore the relationship between Congress and the Constitution and how Congress works, covering everything from topics of the committee system, really interesting, the leadership, also interesting, and even a history of the US House, which is what we will cover today and a separate episode on the history of the US Senate next week. We couldn't ask this to happen at a better time with the topic of everything that's going on in the US House of Representatives and the news the past week. Um, so we're very excited to have this topic. Our special guest today is Dr. Matt Wozniewski, and he is the historian of the US House of Representatives. What a cool job. I love history so much, this is really great. And I'm gonna to get to Matt's introduction in just a minute, but first I'm gonna introduce the panel. So drum roll, please. First we have 19 year old, we've known her since she was what, 12? 12? 12 years old, Tova Love Kaplan. She is a three time winner of our We the Future contest, which you should check out and leads our book club. Tova is a freshman of the, uh, at Harvard, and a leader in many organizations that are blessed by her talents as we are. And Tova is the co-chair of the America 250 Young Leaders Council, helping youth across America get involved in our country's 250th birthday celebration, which is coming up pretty soon. Tova asked the most brilliant questions and I'm sure she'll have a lot to contribute today. As always, Tova, say hello. Hi everyone, um, I'm so excited to be on as always. And you know, Janine, it's always great to be on here with you. Um, and yeah, thank you to our guests for being on. I think you have a really cool role and we're, we're very lucky to be able to hear the insider history from you. So I hope you all enjoy the show. And again, as always, please feel free to put your questions in the chat. Um, we'd love to hear from you all as well. <laughs> Very good. And if I left it off, uh, Tova is our national youth director. Did I leave that off? We wouldn't want to leave anything off. Okay, next, we're so excited to also have with us college graduates and the founders of Sing for America, Jewel and Jorn Gilbert. Do -do 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 please. Sing for America reveals the art of truth and light. You got to love that through live performances. And they bring truth and light to our podcast through their brilliant questions each week. That is so true. Uh, so in depth, the, they usually stump the guests. So get ready, Matt. <laughs> um, we encourage you to visit. Uh, oh, wait, they, they are, uh, they founded Sing for America. We encourage you to visit their website and also visit them and see their shows. If you ever get to Pennsylvania near Easton, be sure to check out their production schedule. I really, really, that's on my bucket list for this year. They are wrapped, they just wrapped up a production of Narnia. Jewel and Jorn Gilbert, would you like to say hello? Yes, hello everybody. Thanks for being on here in January for an interesting show. There you go. We all have a lot of questions. All right. Thank you, Jewel. Um, and next, our fabulous Brigham Young graduate. Graduate. We've known, we've known Aubrey for a long time and Jewel and Jordan for such a long time. Congratulations, Aubrey. Um, and she is our Constituting America Media Director, Aubrey Jackman. Aubrey is responsible for all this fa fabulous technology and getting these podcasts out there into the social media world so you can listen to this whenever you would like. Right, Aubrey, would you like to say hello? Yes, hello everyone. We're glad that you are all here with us today. And I always like to remind our audience that we do record these podcasts so that you can go and listen to them again later and you can share them with family and friends who maybe couldn't be on with us live today. So you can find those on Spotify, iTunes, YouTube, and more information on our website. There you go. Thank you, Aubrey. All right, now our sponsor for today, Tommy and Jeannie Driscoll are longtime supporters of Constituting America. 
Tommy is the former mayor of Crockett, Texas. What a great name. And he and his wife, Jeannie, are fabulous community leaders and volunteers. Tommy and Jeannie, we thank you for sponsoring today's program so much. All righty, another drum roll. Are you ready for this? Our special guest of the day, it's a great honor to introduce Dr. Matt Wozniewski. And let me tell you a little bit about him. Matt Wozniewski is the longest serving historian of the U.S. House of Representatives. Could we ask for a better guest today? In 2010, a National Search Committee of Academic and Public Historians unanimously recommended to hire Dr. Matt Wozniewski for, to the House leadership. And Speaker Nancy Pelosi appointed him historian with the concurrence of then Republican leader John Boehner. Prior to becoming House historian, Matt served as a historian and deputy chief of the House Clerk's Office of History and Preservation from 2002 to 2010. He is the editor of a series of books on women and minority members of Congress. Must be a really cool book. Prior to joining the House, Matt worked as the associate historian. And a fun fact, in the early 1990s, he worked as a sports page editor for a local newspaper in Northern Virginia. He earned a BA from James Madison University, double majoring in journalism and history, and an MA in history from James Madison University. He holds a PhD in U.S. history from the University of Maryland at College Park. Among his awards and honors, James Madison University inducted him as an honorary member of its Phi Beta Kappa chapter in 2012. Ta-da! Now, Aubrey, if you could drop the link to the House Historian's website, we very want to quickly want to show you this, and you can check it out to pull up this. I guess we're doing this now or later. I don't know. It says here we're doing it now, but we can do it later. Uh, so this is the website you can check out uh, later to go over everything uh, about that website, the House Historian's website. Okay, Dr. Wozniewski, we're thrilled to have you here. Welcome to the show. I know you're going to speak a little bit about overview what you do and then we will come in and pepper you with our questions and we'll have audience questions at the very end. So if you're in the audience today joining us, please type in a question in the chat and we would love to get to your question. Okay, you're on. Action as we say in showbiz. Um, thank you, Janine, for the welcome. Uh, and and uh, first off, I, I wanna say that um, uh, what you're doing at Constituting uh, America is really, it's vitally important work uh, because making sure that Civics 101, the, the basis uh, of our governing institutions and their history is a part of the public dialogue, that's a really important thing. So kudos to you uh, for your work, keeping that conversation going. And I, I wanted to make some opening observations about the house that I hope inform the conversation and questions uh, for the rest of the afternoon. Uh, first off, I'm really pleased you're going to have the Senate historian on next week, because one of the things that our two offices uh, try to emphasize for visitors, researchers, interested folks uh, who call our offices and want to know more about Congress, is that while Article One of the Constitution talks about this unitary body called Congress, which literally means the act of coming together, uh, in, in fact, and in, in practice, there are a House and a Senate. They share a building. Sometimes they share members who get elected to one body or the other, um, but they're separate and distinct institutions. Uh, sometimes uh, we view each other, the other body, uh, with, uh, with mutual suspicion, uh, occasionally derision, <laughs> but each chamber has its own peculiar folkways traditions, powers, precedents, rules of procedure, uh, and it even has, they even have two different history offices. So uh, what makes the house unique at the most basic level are the facts of life that flow from its constitutional design. There are two defining features. The first is proportional representation, right? That a state's representation in the house is uh, derives from the size of its population. And the second one is the need for biennial elections, the biennial every two year uh, election requirement. And both of these features were really the result of compromise at the constitutional convention. The battle between big states and small states colored most of that convention, uh, threatened to put the entire enterprise up on the rocks at a few points. Um, 
how would states with vastly different populations be represented in the new government? Well, Benjamin Franklin, who was a delegate from Pennsylvania, summed up the disagreement, and I'm gonna quote him at length here. Uh, he wrote, if a proportional representation takes place, the small states contend that their liberties will be in danger. If an equality of votes is to be put in place, the large states say their money will be in danger. When a broad table is to be made and the edges of the, edges of the planks do not fit, the artist takes a little bit from both and makes a good joint. Well, the good joint that emerged from weeks of stalemate in the summer of 18, uh, 1787 was called the Great Compromise, and it created a bicameral legislature with a house where membership would be determined by state population and a Senate where each state had two seats regardless of population. And that compromise enabled the convention to go on. And that two-year election cycle that requirement for representatives, it really shapes the rhythms and the contours of house history. Uh, James Madison, who played such a critical role at the Constitutional Convention, spelled out precisely the part that, he, that the framers believed the house was gonna play in that new federal architecture. And Madison wrote in one of the Federalist papers that the house should have an immediate dependence on an intimate sympathy with the people. And to ensure that close relationship, the framers considered relatively short terms for the House compared to those of senators. Um, there were proposals at the Constitutional Convention for annual elections uh, every three years, um, terms that would mirror uh, what went on in the, uh, in the state assemblies. But the delegates settled on two-year terms. So every two years, every House member has to stand for re-election. No House member can be appointed uh, to, the, to the House. Uh, even in the cases of um, uh, death or a resignation uh, or illness, uh, members have to be replaced in an election. So there's some consequences that flow from those facts of life. The first being that the House, unlike the U.S. Senate, where members have six-year terms and only a third of those members are ever up for re-election every two years, the House isn't a continuing body. When a, a congressional session ends in the House at the end of each two years, the House adjourns sine die, which means, uh, which is Latin for uh, without day. And uh, it, it essentially means that the House goes out of existence. Um, it must then reconstitute itself uh, in the new Congress. Uh, and in the 18th and 19th centuries, prior to the 20th Amendment, uh, which sets our modern congressional start dates and the presidential inauguration date, the House followed a cycle that largely reflected the agricultural society in which it was born. And also the fact that the job of legislating was still really a part-time endeavor in the 18th and 19th centuries. The new Congress didn't organize itself until more than a year after the elections, in December of the following odd year. And when it met, first in New York City and then in Philadelphia and finally in 1800 in its permanent uh, seat in Washington, DC, its sessions were intense but relatively brief. Uh, we would come into session in December and adjourn in May, and then there'd be a brief lame duck session after the fall elections before the old Congress expired. As Congress professionalized and the federal government had a greater role in the everyday lives of Americans, uh, that became a year-round job. Legislating became a year-round job, and our calendar became more year-round. Um, when the old Congress adjourns and the new one begins, there's a single person who provides continuity in the House between Congresses, and that's the clerk of the House. She's the institution's chief records keeper and the official who helps oversee the legislative process on the floor. And uh, during last week's uh, speaker elections, which lasted over a couple days, it was really gratifying to see that our current clerk, Cheryl Johnson, got a lot of attention uh, for the vital role that the clerk and the support staff generally play in that process. So the clerk opens the house, uh, she certifies the, the members, the list of members, 
and then calls the role of members elect to verify that there's a quorum, there's a minimum number uh, needed to conduct business who are present. And then she presides over the election of the speaker. And until we have a speaker, uh, the House can't reconstitute itself because the speaker swears in the members and then presides over the election of the officers of the House. And then also the rules that are going to govern the House for the next two years. So as we saw last week, there are definite precedents that guide what we call in the House opening day. Um, it's part ceremonial pageant, right? Um, part pep rally sometimes. Um, there's a lot of excitement. There's a sense of renewal. Uh, members often bring children and grandchildren onto the floor as they get ready to take the oath of office. There's other friends and family who are watching from the galleries. In the 19th century, when members had individual desks on the floor, well-wishers had elaborate floral arrangements that were delivered to members' seats. And it became something of a contest to see who had the most bedecked desk. And it wasn't uncommon for members to send themselves their, their own floral arrangements. Um, and at the time, and, and when I, I, I it, it, members would do this, uh, sending floral arrangements to, you know, to their, his seats. And I say his, because there were no women in Congress at that point in the 19th century, that comes later. Um, but also at the time, each representative's individual desk was his entire Washington DC office. There were no office buildings for the House or Senate. There were no support staff. So on, at the conclusion of opening day, the speaker would clear the chamber. He'd ask the members to take their belongings from the desk that they had had in the prior Congress and go to the back of the chamber. And what would happen was they would bring out a page, a, a, usually a preteen or teenage boy who was a messenger, and he would be blindfolded and pull numbered marbles out of a box. And that's how members got their seats by lottery. Um, now we have modern theater style seating that's been in place since 1913. Um, and there are no seat assignments, but uh, the parties still sit in blocks as they have since before the Civil War with Democrats uh, to the presiding officers, if you're looking at me on the presiding officer, to the presiding officers right and Republicans uh, to the left. So biennial elections have also meant that the turnover of the membership of the House also has been historically quite high. In the 19th century, it was not uncommon for as many as a third uh, of uh, the House, sometimes more, in any given Congress to be comprised of first term members. Um, and big electoral shifts could mean big changes in party control. And to give you one example, in 1894, Democrats uh, lost their majority. They were on the receiving end of a lot of public wrath about a very bad economic downturn in 1893. And so many lost election that there were 176 freshman members at, uh, elected to that Congress. And most of them were Republicans who had a 161 seat majority. Um, so, until the late 19th century, most representatives served just two or three terms. As the two-party system that we now have took hold and the House professionalized in the early 20th century, members began to spend 20, 30, 40, sometimes in the case of people like John Dingell, 50 years in the House or longer. And incumbents won at increasingly high percentages and a system of seniority began to develop in the House wherein the longer you're here, the better your committee assignments will be, and as well as your potential for moving up the leadership ladder. But still, even in the modern Congresses, uh, that typical two-year turnover in the House, when you factor in retirements or electoral losses, ranges between as many as 50 and 100 people. Um, and that's not inconsequential. You know, having to face election every two years, representatives also historically spend a great deal of time in their districts. They devote considerable resources to constituent services. And to some degree, I think all this reflects the framers intent for the House, you know, a new influx of people and ideas on a regular basis leads to new priorities. And in that sense, the House is a very sensitive barometer of political trends that are that are kind of bubbling up uh, in the country beyond the Beltway. 
So I'll finish up here uh, just to give you a couple more statistics about the House. Um, when the first federal Congress convened in Federal Hall in New York City in 1789, there were just 65 representatives. Uh, for much of its history, the House membership grew as the country grew, with seats being apportioned in the House after each uh, census, every 10 years, as prescribed in the Constitution. And we reached our present day number, which was fixed by law in 1929. Um, House districts in the 1790s had, it varied, 30,000 seats. Uh, today, we're closer to three quarters of, uh, excuse me, constituents uh, in, in each district. Uh, and today we're closer to three quarters of a million constituents in the typical congressional district. Uh, and to date, um, and I'll give you the exact number, 11,188 individuals have served in the House. That's current through this Congress. And that's about five times more people than have ever served in the Senate. And to close, because the House is the, that part of the federal government that's uh, closest to the people, um, has had the most American citizens serve in it, it has a very rich history for groups that are newly admitted to the political process. So if you look at the story of women and minorities in Congress, it's largely a House-centric story. From the first woman, Jeanette Rankin uh, of Montana in 1917, to the, to the really inspiring stories of African-Americans who served in the House during Reconstruction in the 1870s, to the earliest Hispanic delegates who actually preceded both those groups and served in the early 19th century as territorial delegates. And, and I'll leave you with this. Um, much, I think a great way of looking at House history is to see how it's been driven by how members have made such a large institution that represents so many different unique perspectives and interests function as a legislative body over time. Uh, our history in the House is really defined by a push-pull dynamic between the decentralizing forces that the Constitution put in place, frequent elections, turnover, a large body of members, and the centralizing forces that you need to make the institution function as a legislature. And that latter aspect evolved over many years. Um, and that has a lot to do with the development of a strong speakership, a set of rules that empower the majority, and a, a formal committee system. So with that, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it off and happy to take questions. So thank you. That was inc incredibly intriguing and I could have listened to you all day. <laughs> so thank you so much. Okay, everyone gets their timeshare here to ask questions. So um, I'm, I have about three specific questions, maybe four. So if you keep the answers kind of short, that gives everybody else time to answer. Can, can you just tell us one more time that number of how many people have served in the house in entirety? I didn't catch that number. 11,188. Interesting, that's really interesting. Okay, at first I thought you said a thousand. I'm like, wait, that, that, that doesn't seem right. That, 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 okay, good. That, yeah, and that number is voting representatives. We've also had a couple hundred more delegates and uh, territorial delegates serve. They don't have voting rights okay. on the floor, but but the voting members is 11,188. That interesting, really interesting. Okay, so I thought this past week, uh, past week was interesting. I've often yearned that... Um, our representatives would be on the floor debating, not in back halls or secret rooms in, in the day of say John Quincy Adams and things of that nature. So my question for you is, it's really interesting to hear that they, the desk was all they had um, and they didn't have a room. I think that's, I wish it were that way today. Um, how, when did that end very quickly? When, when, did, the, when did they move into their own offices? Absolutely. That's a great question. So uh, their, their desk was their DC office. I mean, unless you were the speaker or maybe the chairman of a really important committee like Ways and Means, you, you would have a, a room in the Capitol. But most rank and file members did not have an office until the Cannon House, what, what was called in 1908, the House Office Building opened up and uh, all, every member got a Washington, D.C. office for the first time. So 1908. 1908. 
Yeah. Okay. So and then, from like 1789 to 1908, they all had to be in the same room together. Really interesting. Um, like, like they do in England, you know. Um, when when did uh, committees start? Uh, another good question. So in the beginning, the House, um, partly because a lot of members did not uh, want to empower a committee, a standing committee to specialize in, in a matter of jurisdiction. Uh, what they would do was the House would create an ad hoc committee. When a piece of legislation came in or a petition came in, the House would uh, very carefully instruct a group of members who were appointed by the Speaker, five members usually, who would consider the legislation, the, 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 uh, the, the petition, uh, and the House would also instruct them as to how that was to be reported back to the floor, and they would report back to the floor. And then once the work was done, the committee went out of existence. So in the earliest Congresses, we would have, uh, you know, hundreds of these ad hoc committees. We didn't really get a standing committee system until the 1810s. Uh, and that's during the speakership of Henry Clay. It has a lot to do with the growth of the country. It has a lot to do with uh, Clay and other speakers realizing the, the potential of, of having panels that specialized and, and stacking them with allies. Uh, a lot of it had to do with the War of 1812 and, and the complication of having to manage the country uh, as it mobilized and fought the war. Um, but the committee system changes over, over many decades. There's, there's a lot of turning points uh, to that. Okay, so it was about 1810 when they started to, to break into committee. Now, I don't know much, Toba probably more, knows more than I do, but I, I don't know much about how they do it in London. I just know you always see these great scenes of the raucous debate, which we sort of are afraid of today to have a, you know, legal, calm debate among members, but to see the debate, um, to actually see the debate. Do they do it that way in London still? Because uh, I remember I spoke with someone who was on, over there in England, and he says, well, we don't do things like in committee like y'all do. So do they still try to carry on all their business on the floor in London, whereas we do committees? Do, do you know the answer to that question? Are you asking me or are you asking Tova? <laughs> yeah. No, I'm asking um, you. I just said Tova. Uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not terribly well versed in, in commons practice. I, I'll tell you when I do turn in for Tune in to Commons as Prime Minister's uh, question hour uh, to watch yeah. the Prime Minister come into Commons. Okay. Um, interesting, interesting. Because it's, I mean, look, on the one hand, that the, the country has so much to do, you would think you'd have to have committees. But the problem now they have their offices, and then you have TV and you have C SPAN, and no one really communicates anymore. And I think that that's missing. Um, okay, I have one more question, though I have many, but I'll turn it over. Um, what, when, um, you said it was fixed by law. Something you said was fixed by law and with the, gosh, what was it that you said? Apportion, apportionment, the number right. of seats. Okay, okay. so how was that done instead of an amendment to the constitution to change the constitution? Well, the constitution prescribes that, uh, that the census is gonna be taken every 10 years and that uh, house seats are going to be apportioned based on that. Now, in practice, what happens, and, and this is really a thumbnail sketch, but what happens over the course of the 19th century is that as the country grows, uh, the house grows. Um, states do not lose seats. States are gaining seats throughout the 19th century. The only time uh, really that states lose representation in the House is during secession during the Civil War. And then the Southern states are, of course, admitted during Reconstruction. Um, now, what the House, and, and, be, and because that, because uh, congressional reapportionment had to be agreed to, passed as law by the House and the Senate, what often got kicked around were, was the math between how you dealt with uh, fractions of a seat and population. It's a long story. But in 18, in 1910, we actually reach, after the census in 1910, we reach 435 voting seats in the House. And what happens is that 
factions in the House, uh, urban uh, factions and rural factions fight over how apportionment is going to be set for almost 20 years. Uh, we don't I, get. I, I don't. I don't mean to interrupt you. I just know Tova and everyone's like really yeah. wanting time. Can you just yeah. answer the the question? Is instead of what I I wouldn't think that if if it was by census that the House would grow according to the Constitution. To change that would need a constitutional amendment. So I'm just curious how they were able to do that by law, unless I'm missing something here. That just that part, not how it was done, but how could they do that without an amendment to the Constitution to fix it at 435? Unless I'm totally oblivious to what's going on in the constitution but you're well, saying that it had to be by a census that the house would be representative so but how could they make that change without an amendment well because congress was empo- congress was empowered to set the apportionment after every census and so they 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 as the country grew over time the number of seats increased in the house and then the, in the, the Apportionment Act of 1929 set a formula whereby uh, the seats would be capped at 435. Huh. Because they had the right to do it, to set their own rules after a census. So they just threw the census aspect away and said, OK, the rule is going to be this. I just thought that was interesting that it wasn't done by an amendment. I think that happens a lot. We forget that things can be done by an amendment and they kind of get done by laws instead but um okay tova i'm going to turn it over to you thank you thank you i just want to make sure everybody has their time okay there you go tova well yeah thank you so much janine um yeah this is really fascinating and i definitely have some questions um to start off i'm really interested in the work you've done researching uh female and minority members of congress so can you talk about what the research process for your book on that had been like and maybe highlighting any particularly influential female or minority members of Congress you'd like to share with us? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for the great question, Toba. So um, the series of books that we have worked on are actually mandated by Congress and they date back to the 1970s, actually to the U.S. Bicentennial. And uh, in the House, Lindy Boggs, uh, who was a longtime member from uh, Louisiana, was kind of the moving force behind uh, this series of books. So uh, for women in Congress, we, we profile all the women who have served uh, both in the House and the Senate from Jeanette Rankin uh, forward. Jeanette Rankin was uh, seated in the House in 1917, and she's actually one of my, uh, one of my favorite members. Um, she, uh, she comes in she takes her seat on a- April 2nd of 1917. It's the same day that uh, Woodrow Wilson comes to Congress and asks for a declaration of war against Germany. And she's actually one of a group of about 50 members who uh, voted not to, uh, not for, the, for the US not to intervene in World War I. Um, and uh, that is kind of how she's known during that term, but what she does as a member uh, is actually bring the, the cause of women's suffrage to the forefront. She'd been very active in the suffrage movement uh, for many years. She'd actually helped uh, bring uh, women in Montana the right to vote in 1914. And in the House, she argues for uh, the creation of a committee on suffrage, and she's made the ranking member, even though she's a first-term Republican. And she actually comes out onto the floor and she leads the debate for the House's first passage of what would become the 19th Amendment. So definitely one of my favorite members. But if you, if you look at our publications, we profile people like Rankin and the you know, almost 400 women who followed her into Congress in 2,000, 2,500 word essays. We have contextual essays that set them up by generations. Um, and we do that for all the books that we've published uh, on, on women, on African-Americans, Asian Pacific Americans uh, and Hispanic Americans. Uh, so that it's the same format. Um, some other leading members uh, in that series who I like, and we're, we're just now getting ready to uh, publish a book, uh, uh, an updated book on African-Americans in Congress. Uh, Joseph Rainey, who was the first African-American in the house uh, who served in the 1870s, first African-American to preside over the house uh, as a presiding officer for the day. Um, incredibly brave individual um, who was a real advocate for 
uh, black rights during reconstruction. There's just so many stories in those, those books. And, and those are two names that come to mind. Wow, wonderful. Thank you. Um, and then I'm, I have a question about the role of staffers and support staff for Congress people, um, because I think, I mean, I worked for my state senator, not like the national, but my state senator um, as, a, as a staffer and, and got to do a lot, see a lot of the behind the scenes work that I think when we just sort of glorify the, the figure of a representative, we don't always see the work of the staffers that go behind it. Um, so I'm yeah. curious, like, what is the history of staffers in the House? Um, has that always been this, a sort of system that's there? Um, and have staffers and support staff sort of become more influential or important as the number of constituents per representative has, you know, skyrocketed over time? Yeah, another great question. Um, so in, in the 18th century and 19th century, there were very few support staff. I mean, basically, uh, there was the clerk of the House uh, in the earliest years of Congress who, who uh, uh, was the records keeper, helped make sure things were going smoothly on the floor. There was a sergeant at arms who maintained decorum in the chamber. We still have these officers. Um, there were a couple of uh, people who were, uh, well, there was an officer called a doorkeeper. And then a couple staff who kind of like were at the doors. The house had a chaplain from the beginning. But you're really talking about until the late 1800s, a couple dozen staff. Uh, in the house. And what really changes that, this goes back to a, another great question that was asked earlier, is the, uh, the house office buildings uh, coming online, because that was the first time a member had a Washington, D.C. office. And if you have an office, you need a secretary to answer the mail. And that gradually leads to uh, the development of a, of a staff system over time. And the other thing uh, that really uh, increased the number of support staff uh, was the expansion of committees that happened in the 20th century. So as committees professionalized and needed experts in various areas, you know, from consumer safety to foreign policy to national security, there were more uh, professional staff who were brought on for the committees. Well, great, thank you. And then my, my final question is on the role of political parties in the House. So uh, can you just give us a historical overview of that? Um, and have they always been so important to how the House functions? Yeah, uh, the House, uh, wow, that's, uh, we, could, we could sit here and do a whole show on that one, Tova. Um, so um, in the very earliest Congresses, political parties were more factional and regional, um, you know, we had the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists uh, in the 1790s. Um, what develops by the 1830s is something of a familiar two-party system, right? We have the Democrats uh, who are really the party of Andrew Jackson and his supporters, uh, the Whigs, which are the opposition party, Henry Clay, as a senator was a big part of helping the Whig party uh, function. That system falls apart in the 1850s because of uh, sectionalism and the slavery question. And the Whig party dissolves. Uh, and what emerges after a Congress or two is, is what uh, becomes our modern two party system, a democratic party and Republican party. And those two parties have exercised influence uh, over time since then. Um, in the House, what has that meant practically? Uh, it, it has meant that, uh, uh, wow, by the late uh, 1800s, we had a party leadership position that, uh, or structure that was created. Um, so the Constitution only contemplates the Speaker of the House, a federal officer. But when if you watch floor proceedings now if you've watched them in the last week you see well the majority leader the minority leader the whip that whole system came into place as the two-party system solidified in the late 1800s early 20th century and uh that has been over time um that has been a, a pretty stable uh two-party system and um you have the democratic caucus in the house republican conference and, and that is, uh, those two groups uh, run the house, you know, have great influence over the house. 
Great. And then before I pass it on, rapid fire, uh, do you have a favorite member of Congress historically, just one you keep coming back to uh, as, a, as a point of fascination? Absolutely. John Quincy Adams. <laughs> so JQA uh, was, um, I, and I'll tell you, I, we love him in the House because we've had uh, 19 members who have served as president, right? He's the only one who came from the presidency to the House. Uh, he was a leading abolitionist in the 1830s. He fought something in the House called the gag rule, which prevented the reading of uh, uh, anti-slavery petitions on the House floor. He fought it for eight years, argued that it was uh, a violation of his constituents' First Amendment rights, and uh, he eventually won that battle in 1844. Um, but what I really like him for is his journal, his diary, uh, which is has been published in abridged formats. You can find it at the Massachusetts Historical Society online in its entirety. And it's fantastic because here's this guy who has all this experience, president, secretary of state. He'd been a senator. He'd been a, a, the prime. He'd been the minister to Great Britain and Russia. I mean, it, just all this experience and his accounting of what is going on on the floor at any one time and his evaluation of a lot of his colleagues is, is pretty funny and oftentimes devastating. Uh, so uh, JQA is, is uh, he's one of my favorites. It certainly seems like a historian's dream of a, of a politician. <laughs> well, thank you so much for your time and for being on our show and I'll uh, pass on to the next person. Thank you. Thanks, Tova. All right, let's see what there is left to cover. I mean, with your expertise in this topic, I'm sure we could fill up some volumes of books as we ask you questions. Um, but so first of all, I wanted to talk about uh, the also the buildings a little bit. So absolutely, could you tell um, us some of your favorite uh, aspects of the architecture. Right. Well, uh, yeah. No, I in the uh, in the the current uh, building, the the Capitol. So Congress met in New York City first at Federal Hall for uh, uh, part of the first Congress. It moved to Philadelphia, where it spent a decade at Congress Hall, and then it relocated to the Capitol in 1800. And the Capitol has grown over time. It went through a vast expansion in that decade just before the Civil War. The dome went up uh, during the Civil War. Uh, Freedom, the statue at, at the top of the dome was actually put on in December of 1863. There's just so much history behind the building. Um, some of my favorite spaces are uh, what is now called Statuary Hall, which was the hall of the house between uh, 1819 and 1857. So that was the space where Henry Clay was speaker. It's where the Missouri Compromise was passed. Uh, it's where the election of 1824, uh, that the house decided because the electoral college was indecisive. Um, you know, where, where John Quincy Adams becomes president and Henry Clay as speaker uses his influence uh, to steer votes to, uh, to Clay or to, uh, to uh, Adams. Um, that space has just got so much history to it. Um, and then the current house chamber, uh, you know, um, uh, our access to that is a little bit more limited in, in post COVID times, um, but I love going into that space because um, to me, that chamber, uh, that space, uh, it really represents a place of possibilities. You know, we come to our, uh, we can, can come together, we can argue about things, we can debate things, but when Congress wants to act, that space is where big things are done. You know, passage of the 13th, 14th, 15th amendments, declarations of war, um, presidential messages to Congress. So that space is, is to me, it's, you know, it's almost sacred ground. I think you're on mute. Thank you. What yes. year uh, was the new, was the, did the house change location to, from while still in Washington, DC? So the current chamber, when was that constructed or moved into? Sure. So, th so that wing was constructed in the mid 1850s and the house occupied it for the first time in December of 1857, just on the eve of the civil war. 
Oh wow. And then as far as in the in the current chamber, I've actually never I've seen the chamber in um on C SPAN and so I've never seen like a 360 of the chamber. This what is the ceiling of the cha- of the current chamber? Is there is it a dome? Is it is there paintings on the ceiling? What is on the ceiling? Yeah, great question. So um, there is a stained glass. Uh, uh, it's an eagle. Um, but what the, the the real dominating feature around that that ceiling when the room is lit up are the seals from every state. And, uh, and territory are on the ceiling uh, of the chamber. Um, prior to its, it had been renovated in the late 1940s. And prior to that, it was a very elaborate uh, stained glass ceiling uh, that became problematic over time because it leaked pretty badly. And during World War II, it was considered a security uh, issue. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, no, the ceiling is, is fantastic. Glass ceiling. That would have been really cool to see. Um, now a little bit more on the um, on the idea of the house or the principles behind the house historically. What types uh, on this show we're obviously constituting America, and we get down to the history and the and the founding principles behind our branches of government um, quite often from our guests. Is there a point historically when you would say that we have had a, a major shifts in the uh, principles of the house or the principles of the people coming in as the congressmen come in the way they understand their roles um i know that that's a pretty general question so i can make it specific but i was kind of i wanted to ask generally first to see what you may say uh you know when i look at house history it's uh, uh on the one hand i kind of see remarkable continuity in terms of uh, in terms of its rules of uh, procedure and a lot of the precedents and a lot of the traditions, um, I think members have had different conceptions over time of what the role of the House is. I think in the earliest uh, Congresses, and this is partly because of how the public perceived it, um, because the framers and and, and the early Americans were very familiar with legislative government, right? Um, and, that, and the expectation was, I mean, there's, it's, it's no secret why Congress is in Article I and the president's in Article II. I think the expectation was is that, that Congress was going to have a leading role, uh, you know, uh, balance of power and everything, uh, not, notwithstanding. Um, but uh, I think over time, Congress has the 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 uh, power of Congress has kind of ebbed and flowed. Um, you know, if you look at the Civil War Congresses, I think you had a group of members um, led by people like Thaddeus Stevens and and the radical Republicans who felt like it was ta- Congress's time to to lead, especially during Reconstruction. They were going to challenge the powers of the executive, and and they. Uh, challenged Andrew Stephen uh, Andrew Johnson to uh, to the fullest uh, up to impeaching him for impeding uh, what they felt like was a proper con- congressional version of Reconstruction. Um, that's a general answer to a general question. I think it changes over time. In in the modern period, I'll just I'll I'll leave you with this. In the modern period, I think uh, there's a lot of observers who think, uh, in some fronts, that Congress has ceded some of its powers. Um, particularly war making powers. Um, some of that has to do with uh, uh, the fact that uh, uh, war making uh, has changed uh, since the, the, the 18th century um, and the executive uh, branch has, has uh, expanded and, and uh, uh, you know, has to react very quickly to threats. Um, I think those tensions though, kind of ebb and flow over time. Do you think that, um... So there are, like many of the topics that you just mentioned, like war making, there are some other uh, topics which come up quite often as people look to Congress's power given in the Constitution and how it's exercised today. So whether that is um, certain legislating that happens almost outside of Congress's ability from agencies within the 
executive branch and uh, power of the purse and these other things where uh, people will point out that Congress may be allowing their power to be exercised outside of the legis outside of Congress in many different ways. Do you think that there's anything in the function that has changed, like how you mentioned committees and these other like vast changes? Is there anything in the function of Congress which has changed over time, which has uh, precipitated those outcomes? Um, that's a great question. I, I think in the modern period, and, and by modern, I, you know, I'm saying post-World War II, uh, I think a lot of uh, uh, Congress's influence uh, has, um, uh, can be seen in terms of um, uh, oversight of the executive branch. As, as the executive branch has grown in that post-World War II period, Congress often has to play catch up. Um, one of the major changes in the committee system occurred right after World War II. We had a, the Legislative Reorganization Act of 1946, and uh, it really consolidated uh, our, and streamlined the committee system to look like uh, something like we have in the present. Um, but uh, a lot of what Congress has had to do in terms of performing its oversight role has been to play, uh, you know, a, a catch up game uh, with the executive because of the, the expansion of the executive. Not sure if that answers your question entirely, but that's one aspect. And do you think historically that um, after this question, I want to get to some audience ones. So, so to try to ask it quick, um, do you think that um, what you just mentioned about the executive branch, do you think that historically we would they would have expected Congress to more often have cut funding? And I know that that's a particular question, but do you think that that's how they would have seen it um, to function? That that who would have seen it? Would the founders or a, even really not like way after the founders, probably we could go to the one you said, the modern era, the pre-modern era. Would would they would the Congress have then have expected that the that the modern Congress would have more often cut funding from executive programs? That's really hard to say. I mean, we've had Congresses that um, in in the 19th century were were activist Congresses. I mean, um, if you look at the Civil uh, War Congresses, the 37th, 38th. Um, uh, those are turning point Congresses. Congress invested a lot in the growth of the country uh, for the late 19th century. Those are very forward looking Congresses. Um, not only are they managing the Civil War at that point and kind of holding Lincoln's feet to the fire in terms of how the war is being prosecuted. We had a joint committee on the conduct of the war, um, but uh, they are uh, they're legislating for, you know, the land grant college act. Uh, it's how we have public school, public universities, uh, the um, Homestead Act, which helped settle a big chunk of the West, Banking Act. So I, it, it, there are periods where you can point to Congress uh, having an activist, activist role in terms of expanding uh, the footprint of the federal government, and there are others where it, it retrenches. So hard for me to say what the founders would have said, because the founders I don't think ever would have envisioned a country of 330 million people and, and a country as diverse as ours uh, in, in the I have some quick, um, audience ones and sure. so to fit uh, some of these, these, these in, um, and I'll ask him the best that we can um, based on what was written. So could you as quickly as possible say from a, from a historical point of view, what is the purpose of the house of representatives and the, and particularly as having a two house Congress, having a bicameral system. Yeah, well, the purpose of the house, I, I'm the, the founders envisioned the house as being that part of the federal government that was gonna be the closest and most responsive to the people. Um, and they wanted to put some key powers uh, in that part of the federal government uh, that was going to be elected by the people on a regular basis. So that's why the power of the purse, the power to tax and spend, 
uh, is uh, is in the House. Um, the power of impeachment, war making powers that we share with the Senate. Um, the the founders envisioned uh, a, a a body that was going to be very responsive to what the public wanted. And then, um, are you familiar with a rule called a three day and night rule? Um, or under the Constitution, a House can not adjourn for more than three days without the consent of the other. Mm -hmm. um, so it said the question is, is there is there a rule that supports that rule? Or, or I don't think most of the listeners or me myself are familiar with that. Um, but one of the listeners had asked that question. Yeah, um, and I that's getting into to parliamentarian type ground that I'm not terribly familiar with. Um, the House and the Senate can uh, can uh, agree to uh, to an adjournment uh, time, and they have to do that jointly to adjourn. The the question was that location, though, or or timing. I I didn't quite get that. Um, I think I think the question was, does that rule exist? The for uh, adjour uh, adjourning for the three, yeah, that under the Constitution, that neither house can adjourn for more than three days without the consent of the other. Yeah, that's that's still in effect. And then the last question before maybe Janine or Tova wanted to um, ask something else um, is. Did, is there, has there been significant changes in the um, swearing in or opening day uh, ceremonies um, since the beginning? And at what point was the Bible a part of that? And at what point was it not? Yeah. So um, uh, the very first act of, of uh, Congress uh, was to uh, develop an oath of office for federal officials. Uh, the Constitution has an oath of office for the president, uh, but Congress determined the oath for um, uh, other federal officials, in, in, including their own oath. And th that was a, uh, an oath uh, that swore allegiance to the Constitution. Um, so the question of having Bibles, uh, so uh, typically on the House floor in the 19th century, actually all the way up until 1929, delegations were, were sworn in by state delegation alphabetically. Uh, so they would come into the well, the speaker would, would administer the oath, the next state delegation would come in. In 1929, that changed because uh, 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 Speaker Nick Longworth uh, went to the, what we have presently, which is an en masse. Everybody stands up at once and is sworn in. Part of that was because they were fearful. We had, we had the first African-American elected in 30 years, uh, Oscar de Priest from Illinois, a, a Chicago district. And it, uh, Longworth and others are fearful that Southern state delegations who were sworn in before he took the oath would object to his seating. Um, and that process, the en masse, has been in place ever since. Um, no one uh, is required to use any kind of uh, 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 document on the floor to take the oath. Uh, you raise your right hand. Where the Bible comes into play is in the ceremonial swearing in where members often take pictures with the speaker, oftentimes members will bring in uh, the family Bible uh, or other, uh, other documents. We had a member for this Congress take the oath uh, on a Superman number one comic. <laughs> so um, it, can, it can be anything you wanna bring in for the ceremonial swearing in. All right, thank you very much for the wealth of knowledge. And if anyone else would like to say anything as we close out this show, I think it's perfect. Uh, that was truly phenomenal. Dr. Matt was Rosniewski. That was great. Thank you so much. Thank you for inviting me. And if folks want to learn more about uh, the history of the house, history.house.gov. That's our website. And there's a ton of information about history, art, and, and records. I think we were going to put that up, right, Aubrey? Were we going to show that very quickly at the end here? I think that'd be a good thing. It looks like she has it there just so everybody sees it. And while she's looking for that, I will just thank you once again. I could sit and listen to you for hours. <laughs> I could just, I love history so much. And I love the, uh, you know, our country and the house floor. And, and did you say your favorite space was the house floor? I didn't catch that. Yeah, it is the house floor. It's just, uh, it's got yeah. so much, so much going for it. 
that that's I'm with you there. I'd like to see them doing their doing more work on the house floor together. Okay, so this is your website. Yes. History, art, and archives. And we have we have publications up under the exhibition and publication tabs. One of the things we do is do a lot of oral histories with staff and members. Um, we've interviewed people who were pages in the 1930s to speakers of the house. And if you go to the oral history tab, you can take a look at everyone we've interviewed. Um, and we add a lot of new material to that on a regular basis. Awesome, what a great resource this is. This is really, really amazing. So tell us one more time what it is. We're looking at history.house.gov, right? Yep, yep. And it's more than just the history because you can find out uh, a lot about the art and architecture. And if you want to do research on a congressional topic, there's a records tab and you can learn about how to use congressional records and members papers, how you can learn more about committees and the basics of research. And there's also a lot of high resolution documents. There's a database so that you can see primary source documents and uh, click into those and get a little bit of the history behind them. Uh, and uh, so it's a great resource for teachers and students. Wow, what an awesome website. I'm jealous. <laughs> That's really great. Um, well done. Okay, well, listen, we hope you'll come back and visit us. And thank you again for all of your time and your expertise and for your service to the country. Thank you, Janine. Appreciate the opportunity to come on anytime. Bye bye. Okay, thanks a lot. Thanks for watching, everybody. See you next week about the Senate.